Inner Voice, a heartfelt chat with Dr. Fujian. Uh, we will have a podcast that we're going to talk about this book. It is, um, it's a wonderful book that goes through different aspects and the ages of your children. And uh, it tells you all the theories about how your brain works and how their developmental stages work. And then um, what's good about it is also from the awareness integration theory, tells you exactly how to be with your kids and how to talk to them and um, go through some of the major major issues that comes up in particular ages with your children and uh, how to work with your children in those age from the awareness integration theory. I think it's exciting um, and uh, we've got amazing reviews for it and I'm positive that you're going to enjoy it. Um, for you who are with us, who are either therapists or coaches, I also wanted to tell you about the book, Awareness Integration Therapy, Clear the Past, Create a New Future and Live a Fulfilled Life. This book is also has been out. You can get it from my website, uh, fujanzane.com. And that book takes you through the awareness integration theory and teaches you exactly what to do um, when you have a client who you would like to take this approach with. So um, you can get both of those books on Amazon or you can get it from fujanzane.com. Now, exciting news for today. In this episode, I chat with Dr. Walt Karniski. He is a developmental pediatrician trained at Boston Children's Hospital. He was a director of the Division of Developmental Pediatrics at the University of South Florida in Tampa um, for 15 years. He then opened his own private practice for 20 years, evaluating and treating children with ADHD, um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, autism, anxiety, learning disabilities, and other developmental difficulties. During that time, he developed and operated three private schools for children with ADHD, anxiety, and learning disabilities, because he thought that the um, just regular schools were not necessarily attending to the children that needed a little bit different or special uh, recognition, and the children would not fit into those programs. So he created other programs for them, which have been very, very useful. Now, over the past 40 years, he has been practicing and evaluating and treating close to 10,000 children, conducted numerous studies of brain activity in children, and has been the director of the Child Abuse Program and a program for enhancing development in children born prematurely. Dr. Karninsky approaches each child as a unique individual with distinctive strengths and weaknesses and what he diagnoses does not matter as much as understanding the specific needs of that child. We will be talking today about his latest book, ADHD Medication. Does it work and is it safe? I think you will enjoy this conversation as much as I have. I learned a lot from him and the book is impactful and it's gives you all the answers you ever wanted about ADHD. Subscribe to my podcast and YouTube channel. Connect with me through my website, fujanzain.com or any of my social media. Um, get my book, Life Reset. If you uh, are someone who enjoys um, self-help book and uh, can journal, this book allows you to go through the whole process journal it and uh, really gain a lot of um, insight and uh, beside insight kind of shares with you in how to create goals from a different place so you can actually achieve them and um, so you can get that also from amazon if you like let me know how it has helped you um, just send me an email and i love to hear from you i really do i want to know about what's going on um, as you read any of the books, how it has affected you, and it really, really matters to me. Or let me know if there are particular topics that you want me um, and my guests to talk about. Now, without further ado, here he is, Dr. Walt Karniski.
Hello, Dr. Walt Karinsky. Thank you so much for joining me on the, on the show. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. We're going to talk about your wonderful book, ADHD Medication, Does It Work and It's Safe? I think I get that question almost probably every week, a couple of times from parents. And uh, so thank you for doing this and creating a lot of great clarification. Um, so in order to start, maybe we should just first open this conversation up. What is ADHD? What's the difference between ADHD or ADD? Does it look different between children and adults? And I know that in your book, you've shared um, three ways, which is uh, ADHD, which is primarily hyperactive and impulsive, or the one which is hyperactive and um, uh, inattentive. 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 And then you have another one, which is a combined concept. Um, and then or is that different than ADD? So attention deficit disorder versus attention hyperactive um, disorder. So um, that's a lot of questions that I'm throwing at you, but that's what your book is about. ADHD <laughs> medication, does it work? And is it so? Yeah, go ahead. Well, well let, me, let me start by pointing out that uh, ADHD is not considered to be a disease it, uh, or even an abnormality of the brain in the same way that a stroke is, for instance. If you look at the symptoms of a stroke, a person has weakness on one side, they can't talk, they have an asymmetric face, uh, they forget things easily. So th those, those symptoms, nobody would ever question, you need to get into the emergency room right away. But the symptoms of ADHD are all normal behaviors until they're not. And what I mean by that is, uh, so the symptoms of ADHD are distractibility, easily forgetting things, not able to stay focused on something, uh, easily distracted, uh, hyperactivity, impulsivity, and yet every one of the behaviors that I just mentioned are all normal behaviors at some point or another. You've forgotten things at times. I, I know that it, at times I've I've forgotten to do something or easily distracted. My wife reminds me frequently of that. So uh, every one of, and I think that's one of the difficulties in believing that ADHD is a problem is because the behaviors are considered normal. And then it, therefore it's easy for a critic to say, well, it's just, you've got, you've got bad teachers or the parents don't know how to parent. And of course that's not the case. But what is, it? so that's what ADD or ADHD is not. What is it? And I don't really see it as a disease in the same way that I see a stroke as a disease. I see it as an evolutionary difference. And let me explain what I mean by that. Let's say we're back 100,000 years ago and you are in a uh, tribe of cavemen. There's about 30 people in that tribe. And your job is to every morning get up and go out and pick berries for the tribe's breakfast. So one morning you're bent over a bush picking berries and all of a sudden you hear a rustling in the bushes behind you. What do you do? Turn around. Okay, good. And, and look, <laughs> and if, if what you see, but if what you see is the saber tooth tiger, you can run back to the cave. Yes. And if you get back to the cave, everybody's happy that you brought breakfast despite the fact that your life was threatened. Yes. And, and you will become popular in the tribe. You'll mate more fre frequently. You'll have more children and you'll carry that distractibility gene to the next generation. Mm -hmm. Okay. On the other hand, if you're bent over that bush and you're not distracted by the sound and you just keep, keep picking the berries and a saber-toothed tiger is lurking back there, you're that saber-toothed tiger's lunch and the tribe doesn't get breakfast. <laughs> and, and obviously you then cannot carry any gene to the next generation because you don't have children and you're, uh, 
So, so basically ADHD kept us alive and was a positive thing for about 100,000 years until we tell children, you now need to learn how to read and, and you need to go to school and you need to be in school from 8.30 till three o'clock every day. Then those children who would have been leaders of the tribe suddenly find themselves having difficulty in a social setting of school. So basically what that says is that ADHD may not be anything but a mismatch between a child's abilities, strengths, and weaknesses, and the age in which he lives and the expectations that people are putting upon him. So if a, if a child was not forced to focus and attend 100,000 years ago as we were developing, then that doesn't develop in some people's genes. And, and as a result, some people will have difficulty focusing and, and concentrating, and those people will have difficulty in the present day and age, in school, at work, at home with their spouse, and in many other settings as well. So the evolution um, in, in some people has created the non-adaptability as um, life has changed and other humans have adapted to whatever it is that has changed, some group cannot adapt in that way and, and um, therefore show those symptoms consistently. But it also kind of answers the question of, is it, why is it so much diagnosed right now? Is it that it's, it, it is uh, being prevailed everywhere more and more that we could see because life is consistently changing and the same type of behaviors that were there and were adaptive at one point, they're consistently becoming maladaptive since life is changing so many, you know, so much faster, or is it that it is being overdiagnosed, uh, or is it that they never knew to give it a name and today, because now they're create, you know, there's names for it and these are the criteria and all of that, we have a better understanding versus saying like this is just an unruly child, let's say. Right. Well, let me respond to one thing that you said there. And that was a, a, the question of whether ADHD is overdiagnosed or not. Uh, let me tell you a story first. Uh, a few years ago, I went to see my dermatologist, uh, get a checkup every six months. And he, he was out of town at the time. So I saw his, his um, partner. And she walks in the room, she looks at my chart and says, oh, D Dr. Karniski, I understand that you're a doctor. What kind of medicine do you practice? And I told her, well, I'm a developmental pediatrician. I see children with ADHD, autism, learning dis disabilities, anxiety, et cetera. And she said, oh, ADHD, that's overdiagnosed, isn't it? <laughs> and I looked at her and I said, well, let me answer that question by asking you a question. What's the incidence of, of skin cancer in adults over the age of 60? And she said, oh, it's up around 45%. And I said, oh, 45%, then it must be overdiagnosed. And she said, no, 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 it's not overdiagnosed. It's because people don't take care of their skin. They didn't go out in the sun without putting sunscreen on. And they, oh, wait a minute, I see what you're trying to do. And basically what I was trying to do was ex ex explain that the frequency of a problem, a disorder or disease has nothing to do with its validity. So skin cancer does occur in 45% of adults over the age of 60. And ADHD does occur in 7% of the children in the, in the United States and in the world. So it, yes, it is a real diagnosis and uh, it is not overdiagnosed. As a matter of fact, uh, you could argue that in some many cases it's underdiagnosed and missed. My uh, experience with uh, children have been that ADHD has also been a spectrum. So can you share with us if do you find it on a spectrum the same way we look at autism on a spectrum? Or is it that it, 
obviously, you know, uh, to have it in the DSM, we have to have criteria of, you know, five out of 10 and all of that. But mm -hmm. you also see it on a spectrum. And does this a spectrum change by, um, and we'll talk about medication and behavioral uh, treatments, uh, does it change through those from a very um, severe to a little bit mild or uh, it doesn't? It's just you might have more adaptive coping mechanisms and, and you know, being learning and behaviorally and how to handle and with medications, you know, changing obviously the brain chemistry to do, but it doesn't necessarily change the condition itself or does it uh, change as you do this that it changes the whole spectrum of the intensity of it? Well, ADHD does present in, on a spectrum, but it's different from what you see in, in children with autis, autistic spectrum disorder. Okay. And it's, diff, it's different because the spectrum goes from severely affected to normal, normal behavior. So from one end of the spectrum, severely affected to normal behavior at the other end of the spectrum. And that is actually one of the criteria in the book that I wrote. The first chapter does detail how to make the diagnosis and what behaviors must be present and how frequent. But one of the other criteria that most people miss is that those behaviors, not only must they be present, but they must have interfered with a child or an adult's ability to perform his or her job. For a child that's doing well in school and learning, and getting along with other children and developing friendships and relationships. For an adult, that may be mean uh, answering your emails on time and paying your bills on time and, and doing what is expected as an adult. So the, the behaviors of ADHD, I forget things occasionally. I get distracted occasionally. I don't have ADHD though, just because I'm occasionally distracted. So when it gets to the point that those behaviors are occurring so frequently or they are so severe or both, then you have a problem. And that problem we call ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So there are behaviors that are happening externally um, that we could see, uh, we could observe. And uh, it, uh, there's there's two sides of behaviors that I've really seen is one is uh, the inattentiveness, but simultaneously it could be a hyper. It's almost like when they're interested in something, they become hyper um, attentive and they don't even hear anything else. Like they don't even get distracted because they are so into, for example, a game or something that they're doing that they love, that it's almost like they are so much in the zone at that moment, nothing else kind of gets in. And the other side of it is the uh, inability to concentrate, especially on things that they're not interested in, which most of us are not necessarily that interested in everything, but we have the ability to concentrate. That's, for example, right, right. At work, you know, we're not loving everything we do every moment, but we've learned how to concentrate, even though if we don't love it. And something that I've in, um, seen with ADHD is, yeah, if they're not, if it's not one of those things that it really captures them and, and they're really in the zone, almost everything else is, uh, you know, between five minutes to 15 minutes is the max that they can force themselves in a way to concentrate on it. And then they get distracted either by internal mm -hmm entertainment and stimuli, um, daydreaming and whatever their brain goes or something else around the external environment consistently takes their uh, attention away. Is that accurate? That is accurate. And, and as a matter of fact, I have to tell you that one of the most frequent uh, responses from parents, when, when I give them the diagnosis and say that I think your child has ADHD, the parents will frequently say, well, how is it that he can't that he can't focus in school, but he can play a video game for four hours without interruption? And you mentioned that that earlier. Uh, I think you have to remember what is different between a teacher talking about the location of South America on a globe in a classroom 
versus playing a video game where you have to respond immediately. And I would contend what happens in video games is that children are being distracted from their distractions. So in other words, they're playing the video game, somebody walks by in the living room while they're doing it, most kids would look up and say something, but because they're, because, and they might want to say, I'm thirsty, could I have a drink? They look up and start to say it, something happens on the screen and they come back to the screen and don't even ask for the drink. So, so that is a distraction from a distraction and children with ADHD will tend to play video games more because it forces them to focus even when they don't want to or even when they can't. And I've noticed that uh, neurofeedback has um, worked for many as long as they are uh, doing the neurofeedback. It seems like at some level they are experiencing uh, the ability to focus by choice um, versus just being distracted. Have you, uh, have you noticed uh, whether neurofeedback has uh, worked um, side by side with medication? I have to confess that I really haven't been a, I haven't used biofeedback, I haven't recommended it. And of the patients that I see, maybe one out of 20 have tried biofeedback. So I don't really feel that I have a good answer for you on that. What I do know from reading the research is that yes, biofeedback can work for a 10 or 15 minute period, maybe even an hour after it's done, but there's very little evidence, if any, to show that it has any long-term benefits. So in other words, two days after they did the biofeedback, they will then have be having the same difficulties that they had before. Right. So it may work 10 minutes after, but it doesn't necessarily work long-term. Biofeedback does. Neurofeedback, I've, I've seen that it does more than that uh, because they get the, uh, they learn how to uh, focus on different aspects and see the results. So they've learned mm -hmm. how to do that a little bit more, but I do agree with you. It's like going to the gym, obviously, as long as you're going to the gym. It's working for you. And, you know, if a couple of months you don't go to the gym, guess what happens? Your muscles close and that's happened. So I do agree with you that it is working as long as you're working with it. So exactly. it's, a, it's an extra concept of it, but it doesn't take it away or completely have a treatment on it. One of the things that, Dr. Karinsky, it's, uh, it's always fascinating um, and people ask is what happens in the brain of an ADHD? And you describe it so beautifully in your book. Um, and it's always like this, this uh, you know, 100,000 like TV monitors happening at the same time. And um, can you share with us uh, what you have learned with all these thousands and thousands of patients that you've worked with? What is the experience that they've shared with you as, long, you know, as far as what goes on inside of them? I'd be, ha be happy to. Um... First place, let me, let me talk a little bit about how this is a brain problem, even if it's not a brain disease. And, and the first is, let me ask you, what, what is the population of the world? How many people are alive on the face of the earth right now? What would you think? Seven billion and some. Okay, seven billion, exactly. And how many, do you use Facebook? Mm -hmm. How many friends do you have? About, I think, uh, 12,000. Okay, what do you think? Uh, well, I have about six. <laughs> and, and most people, let's say that you, I'd say most adults, most uh, that are not in a profession like yours would have a few hundred friends. But let's imagine a situation in which there are 14 Earths with 7 billion people on each, on each Earth. That's 100 billion people, okay? And that each one of them has 10,000 Facebook friends. Wow. And now every one of those 100 billion people on the 14 Earths send a message to their 10,000 friends all at the same time. 
what would happen? Overwhelming. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and the computer systems all across these worlds would crash as well. And yet that's what happens in the human brain almost every second. The 100 billion people represent the 100 billion nerve cells in the brain, even in a developing child's brain. As a matter of fact, some children actually have more nerve cells than adults do, but that's another, another topic. Uh, so children have 100,000 nerve cells and every one, I'm sorry, 100 billion nerve cells, and every one of those 100 billion nerve cells connects with 10,000 other nerve cells, just like you have 10,000 uh, friends in that example that I gave. So when I want to communicate with another nerve cell, if I'm a nerve cell and I want to communicate with that other nerve cell, I have to pick out where I'm sending that message. I sometimes have to pick out a different pathway to get there. Uh, and of course, nerve cells don't have consciousness, so it happens automatically. But that's the complexity of, of, the, of the situation. So why is it that, that, that we need medication and to correct that problem? Well, the first thing you have to do is understand what's happening at the point of connection between one nerve cell and another. Remember, each nerve cell connects with 10,000 other nerve cells. But at the point of connection, there is an actual space. The nerve cells don't touch. And when the sending nerve cell wants to send a message to the receiving nerve cell, a, a chemical pops out of the end of the nerve cell, crosses that space, hooks up with the receptor on the receiving nerve cell, the receptor gets the message, and then it does what it's supposed to do and the process continues, the, the, it, the cognitive process continues. Uh, but in some people, and in children with ADHD and, and, and research studies have shown that what happens is that when that nerve cell crosses that space um, and, 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 it, and, it, and connects with the receptor, you must assume that something's wrong because if that's all that happened and that was the only process of the nerve cell transmission, then we would be able to send a message from one nerve cell to another only once in that nerve cell's life. So a baby would be born, he would scream, all the nerve cells would respond to that, and then the brain would shut down because all the receptor sites are now full of that transmitter. So there is a third process that goes on, and that is that there is a protein in that space that when it sees there is a nerve cell, I mean a transmitter on the receptor, it goes in and kicks off that um, transmitter, sends it back to the receiving cell, almost like a recycling process, mm -hmm. so it can be used again. And that receiving nerve cell can receive another message. What happens in ADHD is that there is uh, not enough, or, 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 or the proteins that transmit the transmitter back to the receiving nerve cell are actually too efficient. They do their job too well. Because as soon as they see that nerve cell has a receptor, they go in there and they hop, lop it off, send it back to the receiving nerve cell. And if they do it too quickly, the message doesn't get sent. Got it. So what medication does is that it actually slows down that process. It slows down that protein so that it doesn't knock the receptor, re, re, um, transmitter off the receptor as quickly. And it gives the time for that nerve cell to respond. So is that it, also the causality of... Um not having the ability to retain information because one aspect of it is getting the information another one is like paying attention to even gain the information another one is mm -hmm. uh retaining the information because a lot of people who have you know i work a lot of deep traumas i created a psychology model awareness integration which we do a lot of the trauma work there which you go back into the history of the child or the trauma 
And what my experience also has been with the people who um, have ADD or ADHD, that retrieving information and memory from the past has also been very, very difficult. They just don't have remembrance. And even if they do, it, it's not necessarily in a, you know, it's like a full pictorial level. It's always like bits and pieces of things where it doesn't, it doesn't store and get retrieved like someone else. Is that also part of the causality? Absolutely. Uh, let, me, let me point out that what I just described as the cause of ADHD behavior uh, doesn't happen in every nerve cell of the brain. Okay. It only happens in certain areas. And the three areas of the brain, and this won't mean much to many people out there, but the three areas of the brain that we know that are affected in ADHD are the frontal lobe. And the frontal lobe's job is planning, organization, uh, keeping things on track and attending. And then there is a, a group of nerve cells called the frontal cerebellar um, stria. And so that is a communication between the front of the brain and the back of the brain. That area is also affected in ADHD. And the caudate nucleus, a small area in the brain that has to do with learning, attention, and memory is affected as well. So it's not the entire brain. It's maybe only a 5% of the brain is, is affected, but it's those areas of the brain which are important for helping us plan, organize, keep focused, and remembering things. And that's what presents as ADHD. Um, everyone, ADHD medication, does it work? And is it safe by Dr. Walt? Karniski. Um, Dr. Karniski, when you talk about ADHD, um, and, and um, can you also talk a little bit about what the ADHD versus ADD? Because I think that on a, with children, I think we're more apt to learn and diagnose ADHD, <clears throat> but somehow with the adults, it seems like we're getting more diagnosed, like the hyperactivity hides itself or uh, you know, it has a different way. And then we're getting more diagnosis of ADD. Can you say a little bit about the difference between the two? Sure. In the first chapter in my book, I actually go through the history of the names of ADHD. And ADHD in the past has had maybe eight or 10 different names, depending on what we know about the disorder at, at, that, at that time. And the the different names kind of reflect what is most obvious. So initially, ADHD was called hyperkinetic disorder of children. Hyperkinetic meaning focusing on the hyperactive behavior in the children. They didn't even mention the attention, the forgetting, the learning, which are really far more critical and far more important than the hyperactivity. They, address the most obvious characteristic and obvious symptom of ADHD, the hyperactivity. Later on, as we learned that the problem was attention, then we called the disorder attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And more recently, the hyperactivity has been dropped out. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, for, initially it was dropped out. It was initially called attention deficit disorder and then attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And to be honest with you, I don't understand why they added the hyperactivity label back in, because it would have made more sense to me to start with attention deficit disorder, primarily inattentive type or primarily hyperactive type or combined type. And so in other words, because what, what you're basically saying with ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, primarily inattentive type, is that this is, a, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder without the hyperactivity. Pretty and that's much. A, yeah, exactly. So I don't understand why they made the change, but it was made and it was, it was a, a research decision um, and it, it has stuck as well. So we now call the problem ADHD. But, but, it, but for all practical purposes, ADHD and ADD 
for exactly the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in what I've sensed is a lot different. The only difference that I've sensed is the same kind of hyper energy uh, that one has versus the other one, which is the same, but just calmer, does not have the uh, the anxiety, overwhelm, and the, you know, uh, a lot of energy around it. Um, exactly. But it's, everything else is very much the same. I, I, I would agree, yeah. So you talk a lot, of, obviously the name of your book is ADHD medication. So major part of this book, beautifully it's written different types of medication, because again, this is another question that I always get, which is which medication you know, is the best and um, is it stimulant or not? So obviously I'm not a psychiatrist. I always refer them back to their psychiatrist, but um, there's definitely uh, a fear uh, Dr. Karniski, about uh, the the speed, the um, amphetamine, or the type of um, actives that are in the stimulants, which at the time that they're a child, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of fear about the, the child taking that medication. The fear has shown up because um, of supposedly this child growing up and having to be addicted to stimulants or addicted to amphetamines or growing toward addiction, not just dosing right and medication, but fear of if they utilize type of medication, which were stimulants, um, there might be a path toward addiction in the future. Can you share your perspective and your experience on this, please? Sure. Um, if you were just diagnosed with uh, diabetes and you were told that you have a deficiency of insulin and you need to take insulin for the rest of your life and you started taking it and you said, well, I definitely feel much better uh, my blood sugar is better and so on. Would you say that you're addicted to insulin? No. Would you be afraid of getting addicted to insulin? Not necessarily. I mean, no, because the, the, what, the insulin is, the addictive aspect of it is uh, different than my body needs it, so I'm going to take it, but it doesn't do overstimulation because it'll, it'll take what it needs which it doesn't then go into an addiction conversation. Right, but, but, but you could argue that you are now addicted to insulin, which of course is ridiculous. Uh, we would, nobody would ever really say that in a normal medical setting. Right. But in reality, that's the same thing that is happening with ADHD. If we're missing a, uh, not missing a chemical, but if a chemical is overreacting, like I described, and, uh, and over efficient, and we give a medication that makes it as efficient as it's supposed to be, and we need that for the rest of our lives to function, is that an addic addiction? And I would contend that it's, that it's not. Yeah, I don't think so. What I have experienced also has been that if the person, because of their parents or they got older and they figured themselves, I'm feeling better. I can handle this. I don't want medication or due to mm -hmm. um, any other reasons. They didn't have healthcare or something happened and they no longer had it. And then they gravitated actually to a stimulant street drug that I think that because they didn't take care of what they needed to, they gravitated to a street drug where that street drug could be addictive. That's, I think, what I've seen more, but I just wanted to check with you. Theoretically, that's possible. But the research shows that children or adolescents who take medication for their ADHD are far less likely to abuse drugs, to smoke, to use alcohol than children without ADHD. Or with the, the, uh, even with, uh, versus children with ADHD, but who are not medicated. Mm -hmm. So in other words, children who are treated don't have the tendency to, to, to abuse drugs. And let me explain why. If, if you take a street drug, you feel a high, 
and you like that feeling and you want to go back and get it again and again and again. And that's what leads to addiction. And you can describe the biochemical processes that occur, but that's essentially what addiction is. Something feels good, there's a dopamine release, and, and we want to repeat that feeling again and again and again. Okay. And, and furthermore, what will happen is that the longer it goes on, the more of that substance that you need to give you that same high. So, but what's happening in ADHD is not the same thing. In the first place, the research shows that children don't abuse drugs. When they, are take, when they take their medication, they are less likely to abuse drugs. But, but secondly, the problem that I had clinically, when I had, was dealing with a six-year-old that was diagnosed with ADHD, the parents could start their child on medication, uh, could force them to take the medication in the morning. There wasn't much debate about it or discussion. They went off to school and so on. But if you're dealing with a 14-year-old, a 14-year-old is going to question, why do I need this medication? I can concentrate without it. I don't need it. And, I, or, and if the parents insist, all they have to do is put it in their, in their mouth, turn it, move it to the cheek. And if their parents ask to see it, they open their mouth and they don't see the medication, and then they walk into the bathroom and spit it out. The biggest problem that I had in dealing with adolescents was getting them to take their medication. Right. If it was an abusive drug, or if it was causing a high, I wouldn't have had that problem. And so basically what happens when a child takes ADHD medication who has ADHD, they feel as if they don't have ADHD anymore. So they feel neurotypical or, or in, a, in an old sense, normal way. So they don't feel that pressure or the, that dopamine response to take more medication. Uh, uh, they do everything they can to avoid taking the medication, despite the fact that they'll admit that it helps. Right. The other side of it was that uh, there was also a fad between teenagers, which they wanted um, to be ADHD, which they weren't some of them, in order to get uh, Adderall. So mm -hmm. there was also this other fad of, oh, uh, obviously I'm ADHD, I, I need to go get Adderall. So I think that was also another part of where um, this was misused uh, by the teenagers because they wanted um, a pharmaceutical kind of a, a speech. Right versus the street drug, and uh, they felt safer if they got Adderall from a pharmaceutical company versus, you know, going off the street. So I think a lot of these type of mismatches got confusing for parents and adults out there. But what I do hear from you, and in your book is stated clearly, is if someone really is diagnosed by ADHD and uh, the medication can support the brain into coming to a normalcy, and uh, work as its optimum effectiveness, then the, the person who's doing who's taking this medication does not need to divert to anything else because they're being taken care of already. So none of the other pieces matches it. Yes, I mean, anybody can misuse anything that you give them, but we're talking not about people who are not ADHD and are using you know, utilizing speed in any format. Mm -hmm. But we're, talk we're talking about someone who actually does need it and taking medication makes them more efficient in their life and, and uh, you know, works better for them. Exactly. Right. Um, let me respond to that in a, in a little bit more detail. Let's talk about some specific medications as well. You mentioned Adderall. And uh, I actually have about 20 pages in the book specifically about Adderall how it developed, uh, uh, where it came from, what it does, and so on. And, and some of the dubious things that the pharmaceutical companies will do to get a brand name medication. Because the substance that is in Adder Adderall was approved for the treatment of ADHD in the late 1990s. And uh, yet it's been around since the 1800s. The substance that is in it, and that is that is amphetamine. But the, the pharmaceutical company did some maneuvering of the medication, which is explained in the book, and I can't go into detail about that now, it, which allowed the FDA to approve this drug as a new medication for the treatment of ADHD. 
but in reality, it has the main ingredient is the same substance that has been around since the 1800s. And it was used for many other purposes at, at, that, at that time. Um, so along come the, the, the pharmaceutical companies and they get concerned about uh, parents not using the medication because they're afraid that it's gonna be addictive. And the further thing is one of the biggest problems with ADHD is not children abusing the drug, but giving it or selling it to their friends who want to stay up late to study for to, till four o'clock in the morning to study for a test that they have the next next day. Yeah. Okay. So it's and that's called diversion, and diversion is really a much bigger problem than um, abuse. So what people would do, what what the kids would do is they would they would realize they would if they didn't have ADHD they would get high from uh, crushing Adderall and snorting it. And, and that's what led to the diversion. It didn't happen with the ADHD child. Right. It only happened with those without ADHD. Yeah. So, the, so, so along comes um, Teva with pharmaceuticals. And what, what they do is they, t they take dexedrine, which is amphetamine, which is the same medication that's been around for 100 years. Okay. And they hook onto it a amino acid. Amino acid are the building blocks of proteins. And that amino acid called serine links to the amphetamine mo molecule. Well, what happens now is if you, you put that in a pill and if a person takes that pill, crushes it up and snorts it, the amphetamine linked to serine, the amino acid, get, gets into the bloodstream, it goes to the brain, and the brain can't do anything with it. It can't absorb it. So it can't be abused. So th the whole benefit of Vyvanse was to prevent diversion because it would no longer give that same high. But here's the crazy thing about Vyvanse. So th when, you t when you swallow the pill, it gets into the stomach, the stomach breaks it down, absorbs the medication, it goes to the liver, the liver does its job. It then goes to the general bloodstream and all the red blood cells eat up the vivance and the vivance gets absorbed into the red blood cells. And that's not gonna do any good because we really, really want it in the brain, not in the, in the red blood cells. But, it, but it's now in the red blood cells. What the red blood cells do is they cut off the serine and, and separate it from the amphetamine and they release the amphetamine back into the bloodstream, which then goes to the brain and does its job. Mm -hmm. So if you've been listening to what I just said, you realize that you start with a chemical that is inexpensive and easy to make and has been around for over hundred years. And you turn it into a different chemical, put it in the body, the body turns it back into the original chemical once it gets into the bloodstream and into, into the brain. And the difference is dexedrine can be, can be bought for about $15 to $20 uh, for a month's prescription, whereas Vyvanse runs about $300 for a month's prescription. And it is exactly the same medication that is in dexedrine, Adderall, and about 14 other medications as well. Yeah. And, and I obviously I can't go through all those other medications but but I do, there are, how many medications would you guess that there are approved now by the FDA to treat ADHD? 50? Actually, pretty close, it's 46. Okay. Yeah, but most people know only about Ritalin, Adderall, Vyvanse, and maybe they've heard of a few others. I think those are all the stimulant ones, right? But there are also non-stimulant ones that are out there. Correct. Now. There's there are 36 stimulant medications. The stimulants are divided into two types, either methylphenidate, which is Ritalin, Metadate, Daytrana, and many other medications, and the amphetamines, which are uh, Dexedrine, Adderall, Vyvanse, and many other medications in that group as well. There are 36 stimulants and 10. Uh, I'm sorry, it's 36 stimulants divided up between methylphenidate and amphetamine. 
But understand that of those 36 medications, there are is only two active ingredients. Now, in addition to that, there are 10 other med medications to get us to the number 46 that are non-stimulants. And that's a whole nother topic about why you would need a non-stimulant. But the bottom line is non-stimulants are not as effective as stimulants, although they are effective for treating ADHD, they're not as effective as the stimulants. But the benefit of the non-stimulants is that they treat almost all of the side effects that occur from the stimulants. So if you start on a stimulant, get significant side effects, you can switch to a non-stimulant. Maybe you won't get the same beneficial response. You might get 85% of that, but it can get rid of the side effects as well. Right. right. Everyone, ADHD medication, does it work? And is it safe? Uh, by Dr. Walt Karniski. Um, Dr. Karniski, you also talk about, um, we, I want to uh, do this fast because I also want to make sure that uh, if there's anything we haven't missed, but you also talk about non-medical interventions, which you say that it's out there, but you don't necessarily recommend it like mega vitamins and mineral supplements that have been out there and state, you know, that they don't need medication. They could just do this anti-motion sickness medications to, to, uh, to treat the inner ear, treatment of candida, yeast infection, EEG biofeedback training, applied uh, kinesiology, reducing sugar consumption, which I heard a lot for children, optometric vision training. And um, in your book, you talk about these, but you really kind of say, um, you know, even if even if it's so, uh, if there's some um, aspect of uh, workability, but it really doesn't. And what you have suggested is medication plus behavioral therapy together. It seems like it has really, uh, you've seen a lot of uh, working for children as they're, they're growing up, especially as I've seen that when they get both of them early on, um, that they can really utilize all of the behavioral training also, which helps them through teenagehood, which is the utmost level of impulsivity anyway, even if we're seeing people who don't have it. Right. And then through their adults where they can uh, attempt to focus in better ways. And because as an adult, they have to systematize their life on their own. So as a child, yes, they have their mother or father, <clears throat> teachers to come and systematize their life somehow. But as an adult, they don't have anybody else who does that. And then you see that if they haven't really learned uh, uh, or they haven't medicate, been medicated nor learned the behavioral aspect, by the time they're in their 20s and 30s and they haven't really learned, they have very, a lot of difficulty managing their life because even the skills were never learned. What are your thoughts about that? Well, let me, that's probably one of the most important questions that you can ask about ADHD uh, is what happens to the children as they become adults. And I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I have to uh, look at my notes a little bit for this. But first place, children with ADHD are far more likely to have lower grades than children without ADHD. They're more likely to have frequent disciplinary actions at school. They're eight times more likely to be expelled from school than non-ADHD children. Those are things we would expect because we see ADHD as a school-related problem. But did you know that when children with ADHD become adults, they are more likely to change jobs frequently. They're, they're actually likely to be paid less. Uh, some studies have shown that ADHD children earn an average of $10,000 less than their counterparts with the same IQ, the same experience, and the same background, but those who don't have ADHD. Um, and, and furthermore, what they found is that each one of the things I'm going to describe, each one of these behaviors uh, occur less frequently and, and equal to what occurs in people without ADHD if the adults are on medication. Mm -hmm. So in addition to employment, um, to, adults with ADHD have fewer friends. They move more frequently. They're more likely to parent a child out of wedlock. They're more likely to parent a child at a younger age. They're more likely to be divorced. They're more likely to be uh, to have been remarried. They're more likely to have had um, sexually transmitted diseases. They're more likely to have been in car accidents. 
And, it, and then the car accidents are more likely to be severe as indicated by um, one study which looked at the cost of the car accidents and they were more expensive in people who had ADHD indicating that it was a more serious accident. Um, so they're two to six times more likely to have been a car accident. And when they have an accident, it's more serious. They're more likely to have been uh, arrested. They're more likely, three to five times more likely to have been convicted of a crime. And every one of the behaviors that I just described does not occur with that increased frequency if the adults are taking medication. Mm -hmm. To me, it, it, that is the strongest recommendation for medication. And because none of these behaviors improve with a low sugar diet, or none of these behaviors improve with some of the other uh, things that you were talking about. Um, a study was done in the, ninth, in the early 2000s, I believe, so about 20 years ago, and it's really been considered the classical study to answer this question. Uh, the, the study involved hundreds of children with ADHD all across the country in six medical centers. They, the, the children were all defined as having ADHD by a very strict criteria, and only those children with clear-cut, obvious ADHD, not complicated by other problems, were selected for the study. These children were put into four groups. In one group, they were uh, uh, given medication. In the second group, they received behavioral therapies. In the third group, they received both medication and behavioral therapies. And in the fourth group, they were kind of sent out to the community and they said, go back and see your doctor and do whatever your doctor tells you to do. And what did they find? They found that the group with the, the children who had been on medication did far better than that group that was not on medication. Secondly, the group that was on behavioral therapy did a little bit better than the group that was not on medication, but not as well as what the group did on medication. So basically what that study showed us, and it, this is probably the most rigid study that could be performed and done in the cleanest possible way, indicated that, that children with ADHD or adults with ADHD who take medication are far less likely to have those difficulties and those problems. That's why I recommend medication before I recommend those other therapies. One therapy, for example, example is executive function training. And executive function training means teaching children how to get organized, how to use their phone maybe to remind them to start doing their homework and have an alarm set for 30 minutes while they're working, how to organize their time, how to remember that that book report is due next week and they better start reading the book. And executive therapy training really does an excellent job of doing that. Medication kind of works like opening the door. It opens the door, allows you to walk into the next room and get the executive function training and learn from it. But if you don't take medication, the door is closed and you can go in and take the training, but it won't resonate with you. It won't, your body or brain won't respond to it because you're having trouble learning. Yes, I've really experienced that where it, all of it, these trainings have, um, they really try. It's not that they're not trying, but it just isn't working for someone who uh, cannot hold uh, a set to for them to make sure that they hold a set of, of structures, uh, instructions, and moving moving the structure forward. Sometimes it's uh, it feels really bad to them when they can't do it. Then they go through shame and guilt, and there's something wrong with me, and I can't do it. And I've watched this, that uh, exactly how you said it, my experience also has been the same, that when they are uh, on medication, that they're ha having more ability to create these structures and maintain the structures um, versus when they're not on medication. On me when they're not on medication, we have a mishap. Like there are times that they're really focusing and they can, but the moment that they think got it, uh, they lose uh, focus and control again, no matter how much we try to even associate 
you know, put this beside, you know, you uh, brushing your teeth and then, you know, systematically do these things. We clear all the calendar, we do everything, right. but, uh, you know, they do it consciously for about a week and then, you know, it's all, um, it's all taken away again, but they do work when the medication is there. So I've really exactly. experienced that. Exactly. Um, you mentioned one other thing as well about it, about looking at it from the child's perspective. Um, I really empathize with the children with ADHD. They may be running around the room and throwing things and pulling the cat's tail and yelling and screaming and saying, no, I won't do that. But they are suffering just as much, if not more, than the parents are. Um, I, have, I, I print a copy of a letter in, in the book uh, from a, ch a child who told his teacher to shut up in the classroom. His teacher sent him to the principal's office. He actually had to go home that day because of it and so on. The next morning, he comes in with a letter to his teacher. He wrote the letter all on his own. His parents didn't know about it. The teacher didn't know about it. The principal didn't know about it. Nobody told him to write the letter. But he wrote the letter to the, to the teacher and said, Dear Mrs. Miller, I am so sorry that I told you to shut up yesterday. I don't know what happens to me. Sometimes things just blurt out of my mouth without my brain telling me what to think. <laughs> but then he goes on to say, if you will give me another chance, I can be the best child in your classroom and I will really try to learn as hard as I can. This is from a sixth grader. And look at the pain that he was feeling Yes, the teacher was angry. Yes, the teacher was upset. Yes, the parents were upset, but so was he. Yeah, yeah there's it, a, lot, a lot of shame and guilt that consistently I'm not good enough. The, the belief system that holds because every single day they're struggling, it, it's, it's, all, it's always there. So yes. Exactly. Um, Dr. Kerensky, um, in one minute, because uh, we're at coming to the end, is there anything we haven't shared that you really want everybody to know? The, when people ask me questions like you asked me at the beginning of this session about how to, the diagnosis of ADHD, you know, I can look at a whole list of, of behaviors and say, this, this child has this behavior and this behavior and this behavior, and therefore he meets the criteria for ADHD. But in reality, every child has a different set of strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. One child might be have more trouble with distractibility and, and this next child may have more trouble with impulsivity and hyperactivity and not, in, uh, and not uh, distractibility. Um, the, next, the third child might have both of those together. But the point is that I, when, I, when I really get down to seeing a child in my office, I don't really care if he has ADHD or not. I don't really care if the diagnosis is valid or not. What I really care about is trying to find a treatment for that child's difficulties and a way for that child to be more successful in school and have a better self-esteem. And so for some children, they will have straightforward ADHD and we put them on medication and they respond beautifully and they don't have side effects and everything is great for the next 10 or 15 years. The next child may get better with medication, but develop a whole host of side effects from the medications. And then we have to adjust the medication. And that is a, a long process as well. So to answer your question, is there one thing that I haven't discussed that I would like to get across? And that is that every child with ADHD is a unique individual with a unique set of strengths and weaknesses. And it behooves us to address those strengths and weaknesses, to enhance the strengths and to help that child overcome the weaknesses, which is what we do in school for every child, yeah. isn't it? Except yeah. the difference is schools will say, this is the way we teach. And we expect you to learn the way we teach. Whereas the school that I developed uh, a number of years ago, Tampa Day School, and is still in existence, uh, I'm not involved with it as much anymore, but this school says to children, this is the way you learn. 
So we're going to teach this way to address the way you learn. Every child needs to be taught differently. Yes. And, that's and, why and as, a, as a unique individual. Yes. And many uh, students that will become teenagers who drop out of school because of ADHD, they find another way of learning and they can always become very successful because they found another way of learning, actually. Um, exactly. Everyone, every parent who even guesses that their children have ADHD must get this book and read through it. Uh, therapists, although they don't um, diagnose, I mean, we don't, we don't prescribe, but I do think it's important for every therapist, counselor uh, to, to get this book and read it. It has an amazing amount of information. ADHD medication, does it work and is it safe by Dr. Walt Kerniski. Uh, Dr. Kerniski, thank you so much for spending the time with me and sharing your wonderful wisdom and experience. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, I, I know this is sometimes a, a difficult topic. Uh, it seems to go in so many different directions, uh, but that's what it is about AD, uh, ADHD that makes it unique and fascinating yeah. uh, and needs our atten a constant attention as well. Absolutely. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. And for all of you who are out there, create an amazing life for yourself and everyone around you. And until next week, bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.